Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. I had to change my office room back around so I can have the desk set up so I could sit down. <laughs> my a good prayer request that I could ask from the brethren is my knees aren't doing so well and standing for an hour to two hours doing Bible studies, it's, it's wearing on my knees and my lower back. So the Lord helped me move this room around and because it's a very small room. And here we are. I get to sit down and I get to turn to the scriptures with you guys. Uh, more than I normally do. <laughs> so, uh, pray for me, Brother Sis Christ. I'm praying for you. But I titled this study, What Are We Going to Do? Question mark. What are we going to do? Okay. Uh, we're looking out there. If you want to turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. We're going to read verse 1 through 7. Okay. This is what we're seeing going on. They saw it in their time. Paul was telling Timothy and warning him that what he saw in his time and magnify that by a hundredfold to what's going on today. And today I see brethren, they see professing brethren. You see all these fake Christians out there. They're looking at the world and it's like they're running around like a chicken with their head cut off. I remember seeing a comic strip where it showed someone holding a sign that said the world's going to end and they're facing a chicken that's holding a sign saying the sky is falling. And the chicken goes, and I thought I was crazy. Okay, There's just so much craziness going on out there, brothers and sisters of Christ. Um, but we're going to talk about that. Uh, so 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. We're going to start there real quick. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. We see that today. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Now here's the thing. This is primarily, I believe, talking about the lost world as a whole. But can truly Bible-believing, I would say God-fearing, men and women start falling into some of those things? Oh yeah. Why? Because you take the God-fearing off. You're Bible-believing. But you stop fearing God, and you start falling into the ways of the world. But disobedient to parents, we're seeing that in the school systems. We're seeing that with the so-called woke generation and everything. Okay, Unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers. I'm getting that a little bit lately. Incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, despisers of those that are good. Remember that. Traitors, a brother in Christ that in order to be a traitor, you can have traitors that betray you to the government. There's those kind of traitors. You have a neighbor that you thought was your friend, you're being friendly and everything, and they betray you to the government. Traitor. But when it comes to the body of Christ, the word traitor, when it's used as far as the body of Christ, it means someone who once was, someone who saved, who once was at your side, and now they've turned against you. They've become traitors. Do we see that today in the body of Christ? People going the ways of the world, turning their backs on major doctrine, turning, even turning their backs on the plan of salvation. Oh, I was saved by repenting toward, repenting toward God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confessing both in prayer, and ask God to save you. But now I hang out with the easy believism crowd. And I tell people now, it's just only believe, only believe. I repented. I asked God to save me, but you don't have to. What is that? That's a traitor. That's a traitor. And you see that a lot in these last days. Heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Notice it's a capital G, God. You have a lot of fakes and frauds out there that claim to love Jesus Christ, but the life that they live shows that they have a hate for Jesus Christ, a hate for His Word. So who is this talking about? I believe it's talking about the falling away, brothers and sisters in Christ. You have brethren that start falling into lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, especially with the recent videos we've done. That shows that they're lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Okay. I've seen brethren fall away for all kinds of sin. I've seen brethren fall away for traditions of men, for rudiments of the world, for customs. They like to. There's men that used to love Bible words. Those are the three Bible words. They used to love Bible words, but now they're getting away from the Bible words and they're saying custom. They're starting to use lost world terms. 
Okay, what's going on? They're lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And we see that going on. It breaks our heart that the, the body of Christ, I said that in a previous study about how it just seems like, it just seems like a, a gentle breeze is going to knock over the body of Christ. What happened to that solid foundation, the body of Christ standing firm? That breeze can be pleasures more than lovers of God. The sin, lusts of the flesh, rudiments of the world, traditions of men, customs, whatever. You want to try to use the lost word work? Um, saying uh, heritage, culture, whatever. It just seems a small uh, breeze comes by and it just knocks the, the body of Christ over. Why? Because we're not staying vigilant. What does the Bible say? Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil walk around like a roaring, like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I hope I got that right. Okay. We're supposed to be sober, we're supposed to be vigilant. When you take your eyes off Jesus Christ and his imminent return, what happens? Your eyes go on the world. And a lot of brethren have proven that. Their hearts aren't right with the Lord. They're falling away from stands that they once took, and they're going the way of the world. Okay. Verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And we've got another show I'm going to get into, and we're going to be talking about that. Okay, having a form of godliness and denying the power thereof. You've got people that profess to know God, but in works they deny Him. Okay. They believe, they have head belief, because the Bible, we're going to get into a whole other study, but I'm going to get into, hopefully get it done today also along with this one. Just wanted to read the Bible with you guys this morning. And you got some that believe, but then the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but they're always trying to add something else to it. The, the gospel in itself, repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you, that's not enough. So they don't believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. But they have a form of godliness. They're trying to do good works, and oftentimes those good works aren't based in Scripture. You see that a lot with a lot of these easy believism or Catholicism that's out there, and her daughters, all her daughters. Okay. From such, turn away. We're supposed to rebuke them and say, hey, that's not true Christianity. That's not true Bible-believing, God-fearing Christianity. You're a fake. You're a fraud. You need to repent, and you need to get saved the Bible way. And when God said it is finished, it is finished. For of this sort are they which creep into houses. Are we seeing that out there today? I said this in a way in an old study that over half, we have 7 billion population, and it's dropping greatly these days. But the time I was doing it was 7 billion in population, and over half the world's population, over 3.5 billion people believe in a Jesus Christ, and they claim to be godly, but they deny the power thereof. They reject the real Jesus Christ in the King James Bible. And what are they doing? For are they, of this sort are they that which creep into houses, lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lust. Who was the first person Satan goes after? The woman. Who was the first person Satan went after in the Garden of Eden? The woman. The Bible says the woman was deceived, Adam wasn't. Satan's going to mess up the women and look at the women of the world. Feminism, out of control. Abortion, out of control. Marriages falling apart because the women don't want to be wives. They want to be husbands. They want to be the man of the relationship. And the marriage. So he's really destroyed this world, hasn't he? Yes, he has. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Going back to these people that have a form of godliness. Ever learning, oh, I'm studying, I'm studying, I'm studying. I've got all these books. I've got, you know... Um, Let's see if I can remember the name. Catechism. I got the Catholic Catechism. This is my Protestant Catechism. It's not Protestant. It's Catholic. We did some studies on it. We might get back to some of the things in there in the future. Um, it's not, uh, you know, uh, they're ever learning. But they never came into the knowledge of truth. The knowledge of truth is so simple. It's right here. There are bre I've laid, brethren, I leave gospel tracts places. You leave gospel tracts places. Turn to Ephesians 5.15. 
So this is the condition of the world that it's in. We have so many false converts out there, and we've got brethren that are getting messed up by those false converts, and they're falling away. The great fall, I say great, but because today as we get closer and closer, the falling away gets greater and greater, but it just talks about the falling away in the Bible. And the world is just falling apart, and we see what's going on out there. We might get thrown into concentration camps. I'm going to use that word, concentration camps. Um, you know, hard times might be coming. What do we do? What do we do? Turn to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. 15. Ephesians 5. 15. This is talking about the changed life, but 5.15. This is the part that's really important. You want to stop, pause the video, and read verses 1 down through 15. But I'm trying to hurry up because there's a whole chapter I want to read with you, brothers and sisters of Christ. Verse 15. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. The fool has said in his heart there is no God. You're not supposed to be going back to looking like the lost world, acting like the lost world, participating in lost world holidays and whatnot, and what's popular in the world. Okay? But you're supposed to be as wise. Why? Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Are the days evil? Back then, they're saying the days are evil. Compared to back then, magnify it by a million fold, is what I want to say. Are the days today evil? Oh, yeah. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise. But understanding what the will of the Lord is. What the will of the Lord is. What's the will of the Lord? Okay. Turn to Romans chapter 12. And this is the verse I want to go through, you guys. I just wanted to get into context. The world is wicked. There's bad things going on out there. A lot of wickedness going on out there. And no matter what the world throws at us, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? We're going to go through this stuff. And a lot of you are going to be like, that's what I got to do. Okay, that's what... Oh, wait a minute. That's what I'm already doing. Amen. What's the point of this video? We're supposed to just keep living for the Lord every day. It doesn't matter what's going on out there in the world. Point out the window. It doesn't matter what's going on out there in the world. We're to continue to live for Jesus Christ. We're to continue to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We're to continue to be a light unto the world. And the darker and... Like, the days are evil, the darker this world gets, the brighter your light will shine. If you continue to stand, and not faint, and not falter, and not be part of the falling away. Your light starts to dull when you start becoming part of the falling away, and you start looking like the lost world, and acting like the lost world. So Romans chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, mercies of God, that's why I always say grace and peace from God our Father. Grace. What does grace come from? God's mercy. Grace and peace be upon you. I don't wish evil on any of my brothers and sisters of Christ. Even the ones I disagree with. Even the ones that have treated me bad. Even the ones that have fallen. I don't wish evil on anybody. Even the lost world. Other than God's judgment. Okay, God, you know what you're doing. Vengeance is mine. We're going to get in here. I'm getting ahead of myself. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. We read God's will and God's judgment. But when it comes to the brothers and sisters in Christ, that's what this is being written to. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that's all I want, is God's grace and God's peace among the brethren, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. You say, what are we supposed to do? Well, I'll say, are you presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice? You say, what's that talking about? Sanctification. That's number one. When God saves you, He's going to start cleaning up your life, and you're going to stop looking and talking and acting, because i got brethren attacking me using lost world attacks. But I'm a Bible believer. But they're using lost world attacks. They're acting like the lost world. Okay? Be careful. Don't start falling back into the lost world. Okay? But your body, sanctification. Okay, when you get saved, God's going to start cleaning up your life. Why? So you are set apart. Be separate. Okay? You don't have to conform to this world. 
but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Love not the world, neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You're supposed to be separate. That's what the living sacrifice is. You're separate from the world. There's times in your life where it can be a beautiful day outside, but you're in ministry and God says, when's the last time you did a solid, hardcore, hour-long Bible study comparing Scripture with Scripture with Scripture with Scripture with Scripture? Oh, or you want to do something else. And God's like, hey, I need you to do a Bible study. You're supposed to be a living sacrifice. Oh, I might have to eat half the amount of food that I eat now and share some food with some of the brethren. Share some of my clothes with some of the brethren. We could get through some hard, we can come up to some hard times where the brethren need to stand next to each other. But you're supposed to be a living sacrifice. Ultimately, what it's talking about is you're supposed to be set apart from the world. That which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. You're supposed to be set apart. A body that's a living sacrifice will be holy, that's sanctification, acceptable unto God, knowing what the will of God is, what His commands are. We're supposed to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be uh, part of the ministry of reconciliation. Everybody's supposed to be part of the ministry of re reconciliation. Are you praying without ceasing? Are you staying in the Bible? What we're reading right here. Are you reading the Bible every morning and every evening? You start your day with the Word of God, end your day with the Word of God. Are you, but more importantly, not just reading it, because reading, a lot of the lost world reads Bibles, a lot of Bible perversions, but a lot of the lost world reads the King James Bible. But the important part, to be acceptable unto God, remember, God looks at the heart. God sees the heart. Are you hiding God's word in your heart? The Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. When, you're, when you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, how's your sanctification going, brothers and sisters in Christ? That's what you need to focus on, not what's going on out in the world. God's got all that under control. He's the one bringing it about. He's the one allowing it to happen. He's got it under control. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. All things work together for good. It might look like evil out there, but God's allowing it to happen for a reason. We're not supposed to get so distracted by what's going on out there. Point out the window again. Yes, we can open our eyes and look at it and say, okay, the Bible said this was going to happen. But we're supposed to be focused on being a living sacrifice for Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be focusing on our sanctification. How is your sanctification coming along, brothers and sisters of Christ, especially those who are newly saved? I talked about this in my, my testimony, how, wow, God had a lot of work to do on me when I got saved. I thought I was a, I was a professing Christian, and yeah, I was doing some bad things, but I didn't think my life was that bad. I'm talking about, I dropped my, I didn't go about establishing my altar. What I mean is, is I thought, yeah, my bad, I'm, I'm a sinner, I'm dirty, I'm rotten. But how many of you, when you truly got saved, did God show you just how much of a sinner and how rotten you were when he started saying, okay, it's time to clean house? How many of you? You were like, wow, Lord, I didn't realize it was this bad. Okay, I got to get that out of my house. Okay, I got to stop doing that. Okay, I, I'm supposed to be doing this, Lord. And he starts cleaning up your life. Why? So you can be acceptable unto God. Are you living for him? Are you being a light for him? And it says here, which is your reasonable service. How many of the brethren now, well, professing brethren, I say professing brethren, but a lot of the brethren that are going, falling away, they're saying this isn't a reasonable service anymore. I have to be holy as Jesus is holy? You mean God's the final authority, not me? But I like being the final authority. But I like to be accepted among the people. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore shall be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. But I want to be accepted by the world. And you've got these easy believism, they hate this. The belief alone, belief alone, all things are possible if you only believe. Yet Paul says in Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, and he shows how there's Jews that believe, but they're zealous for the law. And I'm pointing at the study we're going to be doing later. They're zealous of the law. In other words, when Jesus said it is finished, they don't believe that. The easy believisms, with their actions, with the life they live, they don't believe it is finished. They got to stack as much 
sin as they can so that grace will abound. And what does God say? Are we to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How we that are dead to sin live any longer therein. Okay? Which is your reasonable service. Anybody who truly gets saved and born again becomes a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman understands that when God calls you to holiness and has you put, present your body as a living sacrifice, you understand sanctification. You understand that it's a reasonable service. It's just reasonable. If I'm going to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ and I'm going to re represent Jesus Christ, I need to obey Him. The Bible says, this is Jesus speaking, if a man love me, <coughs> excuse me, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Jesus said, you are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. We're supposed to be representatives of Jesus Christ, ambassadors, Bible words, ambassadors for Jesus Christ. How many times have you had, how many times have you, I'll point at me first, how many times have I misrepresented Jesus Christ in my life as a Christian? Several. How many times have you done it? If you're honest, you're going to say several. We understand that we need to be different than this world. We need to set the example for the, the of who God is and be a light unto the world. It's a reasonable service. Are you doing that? Are you still handing out gospel tracts? Well, this world, it's just the doors are so closed and this world really just hates Jesus and does and really hates his word and it does. So you know what? I'm, I just don't witness anymore. I just don't witness anymore. Uh, you're still supposed to try. You're not supposed to be a car, I say this, you're not supposed to be a car salesman. You're not supposed to be out there just throwing a face. You, you're still supposed to try. And what I mean by that is, I agree, doors are hardly opening. There's times where I'm able to give out a gospel track and donate some money to, um, I like to donate food more than anything, but sometimes I'll give five dollars or so to some of the homeless and hand them a gospel tract. I'll try to hand gospel tracts out to people on the, the beach. Lately, they've all refused, but I still try. Do you still try? Or do you just have your heart hardened and say, I'm not going to do it anymore, period? I still try. They turn it away, but I still try. I still leave gospel tracts places. Don't give up. I don't mean to stray too much, but don't get up. <laughs> We're talking about, but don't give up on the gospel. We're still here, aren't we? That's because there's still somebody who needs to get saved. There's still people that are going to get saved before the catching away of the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, remember what we were just talking about there. <laughs> I said this in verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove. By the renewing of your mind, how we see sin, we're to hate sin. We're to hate evil. We don't want to, sin does not please God, and we learn that our purpose in life, what's the meaning of life? To please God. For the, the Bible says, for thy pleasure they are and were created, talking about mankind. We were created to please God. Does sin please God? No. So your heart and your mindset changes and says, I don't want anything to do with sin. Someone comes in and shows me that there's something that's sinful in my life, according to the scriptures, that I'm doing something sinful, according to the scriptures, or I'm participating in something evil and sinful and wicked, according to the scriptures, it's gone. And be not conformed to this world. We're not to look like the world. We're supposed to be set apart. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that's the only way. For you to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God is this comes into your heart. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And your life changes. When this is your foundation and your heart's desire is to please God. Well, how do we please God? This word of God, the King James Bible for English speaking people, will tell you how to please God. I'm so frustrated like some of the other brethren are out there by this wicked world, these false converts, and now even our own brothers and sisters in Christ are falling for this, well, I can please God how I want to please God. Remember what we just read earlier? Having a form of godliness, that's the lost world. But right before it, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Well, I'm going to decide how I want to please God, and ultimately when you stray from this book and say, I'm pleasing God, 
and you stray from this book, what you're really doing is pleasing yourself. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. It's about pleasing you. It's about pleasing other people. It's not about pleasing God. You want to be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? You conform to the Bible. You be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You don't conform to the world. There's a change. Verse 3, For I say, through the grace given unto me, Paul is saved, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Remember Jesus Christ. If you call me masters, and yet I've washed, I'm paraphrasing, but I'm your servant washing your feet, so you should be to other people. When you start getting into ministry, you should not get so puffed up, puffed up and think more than you ought to think highly of yourself. Am I an elder in the church? Yes. Do I tell you guys that, uh, I'll, I'll quote the scriptures on how you're supposed to treat an elder, but do I take myself and elevate myself above that? I'm a servant. If I'm doing something wrong, correct me. If I need encouragement, please encourage me, brothers. That's what exhorting is in the Bible. Encouraging the brethren to stand for this word and continue on that path. Encouraging the brethren to keep their eyes on Jesus Christ. But you don't think higher than you ought to. What happens? What happens when you think higher than you ought to? Read in Roman, uh, Revelation about the Nicolaitans, like the Lord over the flock. The scribes. It's almost like going back to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes. They all, they, all, they all thought highly of themselves, more than they ought to think. They weren't servants to the Jewish people. They were lording over them. Oh yeah. But what does this lead to, more than anything? When you start thinking highly of yourself than you should, you know what it automatically leads to, and I see this among the brethren. And I pray that, Lord, when I start to see it in my life, because I've made the same mistakes too, that Lord crushes it and gets it out of my life. And you know what it is? Pride. You start thinking highly of yourself, and you start getting prideful. You start becoming above correction. You start becoming above accountability. Okay. And I've seen that among the brethren. And I prayed the Lord, I said, Lord, I don't want to be above correction. I don't want to be above accountability. And I've already talked about this. In these days, it's hard to be accountable. What's going to help the body of Christ out in these last days, more than anything, I believe, is if we start forming house churches again. Start coming together face-to-face -to -face physically so we can A, be there physically to help the brethren out, help each other out, and we're there physically to see how we're living and hold each other accountable to the Word of God. Oh, you're starting to stray there, brother. Right now you see me on a camera, but you don't actually see how I'm living. I can tell you how I'm living, but you don't actually see it. We need to get back to true accountability. I believe that. If I could start a house church here, if there was other brethren here, I'd start a house church in a heartbeat. But like I said before, it just seems like for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles away, there's no brethren. I have one brother in Medford. He's also a family member. But brother in Christ, that's it. Okay. What happens when you start thinking highly of yourself? You start getting prideful. You start becoming Nicolaitan. My word is law. Yeah, but, what, but the Bible says, don't you correct me. And then when they're caught wrong, I'm sorry, i got to say this, but when, I've seen brethren out there that when they're caught wrong in the scriptures, instead of just dropping the pride and saying, hey, you know what, you're right. The scriptures say this, not that, not that I'm right, but that God's right, because I could be wrong. God's right. The scriptures are right. And concede, what happens is, is, the scriptures say I'm wrong, so what do I got to do? I got to change the scriptures. And that's dangerous. But that all comes to people that get prideful and start thinking highly of themselves above that they are. Okay? But to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. God, might have, God called me into ministry. He might call you into ministry someday. He might not. He might use you somewhere else to exhort the brethren, which we're going to talk about, to exhort the brethren. Okay? There's different ways to serve the Lord. But we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. But it says here to think soberly. To think soberly. The number one thing that brings comes to mind is when the Bible says, Be sober, 
Be vigilant for your adversary the devil coming around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Satan is coming in and he's infiltrating all the false religions of the world and he's also trying to infiltrate Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women. The true, biblically, Christianity. He's coming in among us with hirelings, with false converts, and he's trying to mess us up. The Bible says we're supposed to be sober, to think soberly. How does one think soberly? Making sure that you keep, you're hiding God's word in your heart. You're staying in the book and reading this book and knowing this book like you're supposed to. That way they come along and you're like, I'm sorry, what you just said there, that goes against scripture. I'm not doing that. Uh, what you just said there, that's wrong. And more than anything, they're, what's going on with these false converts are coming in and they're doing whispering and uh, backbiting, starting gossip, getting you to go back to the old man getting you to start acting like the lost world, get you to start attacking brothers and sisters in Christ instead of going to them and talking to them. I've tried to resolve my differences with the brethren that I disagree with. I've tried, but some of them are too prideful. Mm -hmm. According to as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith, we respect all the brothers and sisters in Christ equally. And we understand that God might have called him to ministry. And we'll get to that here as we get down closer. To teach, to preach, to do all kinds of things. To help out and give the brethren. Someone might be more blessed than someone else. So you can help the brethren that are less fortunate. And in these last days, there are a lot of brethren that have lost their job. And we need to be helping them. Okay? I've been trying my best to help them. I'm out here. I've put out my email address. Uh, P.O. box to see if I can help the brethren out. I bought Bibles for brethren that couldn't afford some of the nice Bibles. I, they couldn't afford uh, some of the reading materials, study materials um, that I bought some for them. I've helped brethren out. Right? But it's getting ahead of myself. But everybody has different gifts and we're supposed to respect them equally. We're not supposed to look down and think one's higher than the other. That if you actually become a pastor or a preacher and that's the highest level of respect. And you deserve more respect than the person at the bottom that's donating. Or the person that's, that's uh, out there uh, witnessing, just dropping gospel tracts out. The brother that's, that's there exhorting people in the comment section, just exhorting, trying to encourage the brethren. Continue to stand for the word of God. Continue living for Jesus Christ every day. Continue looking for that blessed hope. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. The, although he's not as important as the man behind the camera preaching and teaching. No, you are, brothers and Christ, you are just as important. Verse 4, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one member one of another. Having then gifts different according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy, according to the proportion of faith. Okay, our prophecies today come from the Word of God. The time that this was being written, it was also the spoken word. Paul is an apostle. He had a special office. God was speaking directly through him, and he was ver verbally speaking to the people. And he was writing letters to the people. Today, our prophecy comes from the scriptures. Okay, And he'll help brethren, because I've, I've learned more from the brethren. I, I, there's some brethren that, that can read a lot of things from the Old Testament, the prophecies from the Old Testament, some of the prophecies here, and they can do great teachings, like on the pre-time of Jacob's trouble, talking about the time of Jacob's trouble, talking about the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ, because God has given them a gift of being able to read these prophecies and help explain them, comparing Scripture with Scripture and Scripture, how some prophecies have been fulfilled. Jesus fulfilled some prophecies, but he hasn't fulfilled them all yet. There's still some prophecies he will fulfill in the future. Mm -hmm. Or ministry. Let us wait on our ministering. Okay, when ministry. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth. Their brethren are really good at using the words of God and quoting scripture to exhort the brethren. There's times where I'm just, I, I, I'm having a bad day. I'm very sorrowful at the condition of the body of Christ, at the condition of the world. Sometimes it feels like I'm, it's like swimming against the current and you're not going anywhere. That's how I feel sometimes. And a brother in Christ will link a scripture under one of my videos and it'll exhort me. It'll encourage me. There are brethren that are 
that God has chosen to use to exhort the brethren. Okay. For he that exhorteth on exhortation with the word of God. As I always tell brethren, the best way to exhort somebody is with the word of God. Remind them of that blessed hope. Remind them that we were once without God in the world and without hope. We have a purpose now. When we were lost, we were worthless. We were, just, we were just sitting there going with the flow, floating down the river. Now we're having to swim upstream. We have a purpose. We know where we're going to go when we die. We're looking for that blessed hope, the catching away of the body of Christ. We're looking for that new body, <laughs> that hope of a new body, praise the Lord. Okay, there's brethren who are really good at that. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. There's, like I said, there's some brethren that might have extra stuff that they can share. Clothes, food. You need a place to stay. I've got an extra room. In these last times, it might get to that. We have brethren that start losing their homes and start having hard times. You got an extra room for a brother or sister in Christ? You got an extra room to keep warm. To get out of the rain. He that ruleth with diligence. Right? I'm not saying I ruleth, but when you have brethren that get into ministry and they start preaching and they start teaching, they're given authority from the Lord. We're not to abuse that authority. Okay? With diligence. We're supposed to be diligent that that authority comes from the Word of God. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. There's a lot of times in your life where God's going to ask you to show mercy. That person that wronged you, that hurt you, he might deserve all kinds of, ju we want justice, we want justice. You're going to have to learn to be merciful. Okay? He that showeth mercy, mercy, mercy with cheerfulness. That's hard. Sometimes we, we, show, we show mercy with like, like okay, yeah, okay. Uh -huh. And we, begrud we begrudgingly show mercy. But how, how often do you do it cheerfully? The best way that I've learned to do it cheerfully, brother says Christ, is remember how many times God forgave you. How many times have you failed the Lord? How many times have you backpedaled? How many times have you wronged the brethren? I look at myself and go, well, if God could forgive me, I need to have that same mercy. And I need to do it with cheerfulness. Not begrudgingly, not mouthing off, being sarcastic and mouthing off, not mockingly, cheerfully. Verse 9, let love be without dissimulation. That's hard in the world. And what I mean by that is in the world, the love that the world's always preaching, God is love, God is love, that's fake love. I'm not saying that God's love is fake. I'm talking about what they preach as God's love is fake. It's not real. All these people, all oh, love, love, love. They have no clue what real love is. You and I do, brothers and sisters in Christ. And we try to share that with the lost world. What do we do in these last days? Continue to share what true love is. Loved, for God so loved you back at the cross. Be careful about the present tense, love for the lost world. Uh, God's going to send people who reject Him to hell. That ain't love. That's judgment. That's wrath. He's going to be pouring His wrath out on this world in the time of Jacob's trouble. That's not love. Okay? He loved the world. But love without dissemination. When I say I love grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm only capable of loving you, brothers and sisters Christ, with true love, real love, because of what my Savior did for me, what Jesus Christ did for me and did for you. But our love is supposed to be without dissimulation. We get so, so many people have been deceived on what real love is. Love is just a feeling. It's flesh. It's flesh. It's flesh. That's what the lost world pushes. Love is a feeling. It's flesh. No, love is an act of your will. Remember what Jesus said, if a man love me, he will keep my words. True love is action. Let love be without dissimulation. In other words, another way to say it is it's not just, you're not just saying it, you know, words, but do your deeds, your actions back up that love you have for a brother or sister in Christ. True love for the lost world. Oh yeah, I, I truly love the lost world and I, I, I have such sorrow for what's going on. Are you still trying to hand out gospel tracts when you can? 
Lay, anytime you go to town, you laying gospel tracks around. Leaving them places. Have you given up? Love, let love be without dissimulation. Don't let it be fake. Don't let it be just a word you speak and it just becomes something that's in your vocabulary, but not in your life. It's not in your heart and it's not in your life. Abhor that which is evil. Let me see that again. What are we supposed to be doing? What do we do today? What do we do? We're to abhor that which is evil. All the stuff that's going on out there, brothers, is Christ. Abhor it. By all means, abhor it. Tell brethren, warn brethren against it. Absolutely. Try to warn the lost world against it. Absolutely when you can. But you're going to abhor evil. Don't lose your testimony because you allow evil into your home. And then you turn around and tell people they need to stay away from that evil. But you've got another form of evil in your home. I keep telling brethren, I've gone through my home and God's pretty much cleaned it up. But you'll be sh shocked. I've been here five years. Two years into living here, I'm like, this is finally the first home I've ever lived in as a saved man. Because I've been saved seven years. Two years at my first house. I had it all set up where it had a theater room for watching Hollywood movies and playing video games. I had a pool table with another TV where you could watch sports as you're playing pool. And I had a swimming pool. And I had such bad memories when I got saved and God was trying to clean up my life of all the sin, all that, temp not bad memories, temptation. I'll say it like that. The temptation. Okay. And when I got here, I was like, I'm going to make this home a Bible-believing, God-fearing home. A place where I can be safe. Because how bad it is out there. How many of us understand? That's, it's, anytime you go out your door, you leave your property, and you go into town, it's just wickedness. Left and right. Okay, you're going, that's, that's the battleground. You want this to be the ground where you're, you get to come, and you get to pray, and you get to read the Word of God, and you're free from temptation from, to, a, to a point. I mean, temptation will still try to get you any time, but the point, without getting too far away, is two years into this house, I thought I had everything done. It's great and it's good to go. And I walked by and God, just out of the corner of my eye, I saw something. And God just in my heart was saying, you need to go look at that. And I went and looked at it. Oh, it's a pagan idol. It's a pagan idol. I think it was like a, a year later, God pointed something else out. And I was like, how did I miss that? Lord, I'm so sorry. How did I miss It's a continuous thing. We're to abhor evil our entire lives. You're never going to get to a point where you're going to, everything's going to be perfect and no more evil. Not until the catch away of the body of Christ and we get to go to heaven. We get rid of this wicked body. This body of uh, sinful flesh. Okay? We're going to be having to abhor evil till the day we die. And what's the opposite of abhor abhorring evil? If you truly abhor evil, then what are you going to do? You're going to cleave to that which is good. And once again, I'm going to go through it again. You know what's good? Prayer. Are you praying a lot? Especially in these last days. Are you praying a lot, Brother Jesus Christ? How many of you, the Bible's been put to the side, it's starting to collect dust, you haven't read the Bible in a while, you really haven't prayed in a while? It's been a while since you got, gave God thanks for anything? Or given God glory in anything? Because you're being distracted by things, whether they're sins of the flesh, what's going on in the world, traditions of men? Rudiments of the world, culture, cleave to that which is good. Cleave. Which, when's the last, last time that you helped out a brother in Christ? It's hard. I mean, we're all separated right now, but if it's possible. Verse 10. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love. I have to admit that this also includes what we're talking about. When someone's wronged you, you still have to have brotherly love. When you go to correct a brother in Christ, you do it out of love. Okay, you don't do it out of hate. You don't do it out of spite. You don't do it out of bitterness. You don't do it out of hoard, lording over the flock. I'm better than you, so I'm, that's why I'm correcting you. Absolutely not. Okay, by kindly affection one to another with brotherly love. Be kindly affectionate to one another. Brotherly love. In these last days, we're going to need to come together, brothers and Christ. Right now, Satan is infiltrating. Satan is, is like gossip. He's trying to entice the brethren and trying to separate the brethren. We need to come together. And we need to have brotherly love. We need to be there for one another. We need to be praying for one another. Correcting one another in love. And taking correction 
with love. When someone goes to correct you, one of the hardest things is the first thing I talked about. you got to worry about how you correct a brother in Christ, because if you do it the wrong way, not with love, that brother can put up a shield. Pride starts coming in, that brother puts up a shield, and he's not going to listen. How you correct a brother in Christ is supposed to be with love. Not out of bitterness, not out of anger, not out of hatred, not out of superiority, but out of love. And honor preferring one another. I know some of you might get go, oh, he's going to bring this up. I am. In my life, what this is saying, preferring one another, and honor, honor preferring one another. There's nothing in this world, brothers and sisters of Christ, physical things of this world, traditions of men, sin, lusts of the flesh, nothing in this world is worth getting in the way of your fellowship with the brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not worth it. You're supposed to be preferring one another. If I had to, I talked to the Lord life. If I had to, I said, I would sell this house and move somewhere to be part of the house church. So I could have fellowship, face-to-face -face fellowship, being able to sing hymns instead of singing hymns by myself all the time, to be able to sing hymns with a brother and sister in Christ. Preferring one another. There's nothing in this house, physical items in this house, this is different. This is your number one, this is your most prized physical possession, the King James Bible. You're not supposed to turn your back on the Word of God for anything in this world. But everything else in this bot in this house, it's not worth it. Sins of the flesh, lusts of the flesh, sins of the flesh, it's not worth it. We're supposed to be preferring one another. And you've got brethren that aren't. They like the debating, they like the arguing, they like the fighting. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I'll say it again, it's not worth it. Whatever it is that's getting in the way of your fellowship with the brethren, whatever it is that's getting in the way of your ministry, if you're a man in ministry, What's ever getting in the way of your marriage, if you're married, a sister in Christ or a brother in Christ, it's not worth it. It's not. Okay. I've had marriages fail because one of them decided that uh, uh, drunkenness and weed and cigarettes and satanic style music and all kinds of sin was more important than their marriage. They weren't preferring one another. What happens? How, what's the number one reason I believe that fellowships fall apart? One, this is not, someone is not as pulling you away from this book as being the final authority. That's the first reason. But the second reason is, is they get you to prefer the world. Remember, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God? You start preferring the world. And they pull you away from this, and it'll start messing up your fellowship with the brethren. You're supposed to be preferring one another. What do we do in these last days? We need to come together. What, what are we supposed to do? We look what's going on out of the world. We're supposed to be coming together and being stronger together. Standing, the Bible says, striving together. Verse 11, not slothful in business. Brothers and sisters Christ, a lot of us have lost our jobs and what's happening out there. But if you own a job or you're doing a business, something as small as, you can have a stand at the farmer's market. I go to the farmer's market, I try to support the farmer's market over the grocery stores any day. I get most of my stuff from the farmer's market. There's a few things I'll get from the grocery stores these days. Very few. But most of the time I go to the farmer's market slash flea market. Okay, there was a lady down there that knew how to sew, and I didn't, and I had her fix a couple of my old blankets. Because I didn't want to, it's cheaper to have them fixed. Because a lot of people just toss them and then you go to buy new ones. And I'm all about saving money to help out the brother, not hoarding money. But so I could do my donations that I do. And that you do, Brother and Sister Christ. We all try to save money when we can. But I went to her and had her fix it from the flea market. I'd rather go there and help them that's doing a business there than to throw it away, I have, like in the burn pile. Because the blanket was getting, it's an old quilted, quilted blanket that was getting, the stitches was coming out and it was ripping. And I was like, we need to get it fixed. Right. Uh, but you're not supposed to be slothful in business. And what to get to that point is, is today, what we see going on out there in the world, what do we do? What do we do? It used to be way back when, I'm talking about you go back 100 plus years. I'm using this as an example, a dollar. If you made 50%, that was good. So if it cost you a dollar, that include all the fees, taxes, the materials. If it cost you a dollar to put that product together and sell it, 
and you sold it for $1.50, you did great. 50% profit, you did great. But what's going on out there today? Today, they tell you that if the business is not making at least three to 500% profit on, on an item, it's not worth investing in. What is that? That's slothfulness. Love of money is the root of all evil. When you're in business, you're supposed to treat people right with how you sell, how much you sell a product for, and you sell a good product. Don't sell something that's defective. You sell a good product. Okay? Make sure that you're doing 100% in business and what you're selling is a good thing. But don't be slothful in business, brothers and sisters of Christ. Um, some people, real quick, some people, brothers and sisters of Christ, you get into ministry, one of if you get into ministry to the point where you start taking donations, be very careful that it doesn't become a business. I want to throw that out there real quick. Be careful that it doesn't become a business. If you get called into ministry to preach or teach, it's a life calling and you're doing it for the Lord, whether you get a penny or you get $1,000 or zero. It doesn't matter. You're doing it for the Lord because you're called into ministry to serve God. Now, we should be donating to men in ministry. The Bible says the laborer is worthy of his reward. But the point is, is don't start treating it like a business. You cannot separate, in other words, you cannot separate and say, I want a separate life apart from my ministry life. I, I, I want my family life separate from my ministry life. I want my fun life over here separate from my ministry life for the single people, brethren out there trying to get into ministry. You can't do that. You cannot live two separate lives or half-lives, as they say. It was just separate, but two half-lives. You're going to live one whole life. If you get called into ministry, then ministry and your family, it all becomes one. Don't separate the two. I've known brethren who've tried to separate the two, and they start treating it like a business, and things don't go well. Be very careful in that. Fervent in spirit. Brothers and Christ, fervent in spirit. Okay. <clears throat> One of the signs of a false convert is they don't have a love of the Word of God. Okay. We're supposed to love the Lord. That's why the next part says serving the Lord. We're supposed to be fervent in spirit. We're supposed to remember what the Bible says. We're supposed to be minding high things. Okay, um, the, He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not because ye are not of God. The Holy Spirit comes in, and we talked about this with our conscience study, how our conscience, our spirit, bears witness with the Holy Spirit. Okay? You're supposed to be fervent in the Spirit. Is your spirit, which is your conscience, bearing witness with the Holy Spirit all the time? Thank you, Lord. I see that, Lord. Are you, oh, thank you, Lord, for this happening, or thank you, Lord, for that happening. To God be the glory. The hardest times it is to be fervent in the Spirit is when bad things are happening. I was watching a study by Peter Ruckman where he talks about the hardest thing for us to do is to give God thanks and glory when bad things are happening. Yeah, we still need to give God thanks because He knows what He's doing. We might not see the whole ramifications of why He's doing it because we're not God. But God does. You need to trust God. And you still need to give Him thanks and give Him glory. Even when bad things are happening, we're going through bad times and tough times. Okay? Mm -hmm. But always serving the Lord, brother and sister Christ. What do we do? Continue to serve the Lord. What do we do with what's going on in the world today? Continue to serve the Lord until He takes us home. Until he t I always say this, until He takes me home or until He takes us home. <laughs> in other words, I could die before the catching away of the body of Christ and God's calling me home. Or He could call us all home at the catching away of the body of Christ. Continue to serve the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Remember what we said. Before we got saved, we were without hope in the world and without God in the world. Are you looking for that blessed hope? Are you rejoicing in that hope? No matter how hard things get here, brother, sister, Christ, one of the biggest encouragement we give to each other is, no matter how bad it gets here, when we get to go to heaven... Jesus said, He's in my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. 
The catching away. We're supposed to be encouraging people with the catching away. And you've got brethren that are disc not encouraging the brethren with the catching away. They're saying, well, instead of it could happen any day, encouragement to live for Jesus Christ. When you say that the catching away of the body of Christ can happen every day, you're saying you're supposed to live for Jesus Christ every day. You're supposed to be looking for Jesus. That's what looking for Jesus Christ is. You're living it. And we're going to be doing a study eventually on the helmet for a hope of salvation, which some of the brethren have taken off. Okay. Mm -hmm. But they're trying to steal people's hope. <coughs> when you say that God's not coming, that Jesus isn't coming for five or ten years, what are you doing? Oh, Jesus is not coming. Might not. I don't think Jesus is coming in our lifetime. What are you doing? You're trying to steal people's hope. What is hope? Or, I mean, faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You're trying to destroy people's faith in the, in the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Their faith in living every day for Jesus Christ. The things of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Okay? We don't know when the catching away of the body of Christ is. But you have brethren that are starting to fall into the trap of trying to say when the catching away of the body of Christ is. Okay? Be very careful. You're supposed to be rejoicing in that hope. That's one of the things that keeps me going, brothers and sisters Christ. Doesn't it keep you going? Knowing that any day God could call us home. Whether it's death or the catching away of the body of Christ. We get to go home to a better life than this. This is nothing. Everything in this world is nothing compared to what waits for us. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. There it is, that hard thing. Being patient in tribulation. Giving God thanks. All these hard times that are happening, are you giving God thanks? You're still breathing. You still have clothes on your back. You're still getting to eat one meal a day, minimum. I, some of you are, it's harder than that. Get with me, get with some of the brethren, and we'll try to help out. But you're still breathing. You can still do the work of the Lord. There's a lot of times that bad things happen to you in my life. A lot of the bad things that happened in my life, I was responsible for. Because I made a bad decision. That's not the same thing here. When it says patient and tribulate, it's talking about with the way the world's going. When God is pouring out His wrath on the world, He's punishing the world. When God is moving the world around, moving the pieces around, getting ready for the catching away of the body of Christ, so He can pour out His wrath in the time of Jacob's trouble, okay, there's going to be tribulation. The enemy is always going to be trying to attack us and go after us. There's going to be tribulation. There was in the past for the, for the body of Christ, there will be today, and there will be in the future. If we're here a little bit longer than, you know, but we've got to remember to be patient in tribulation. What happens when you're patient? You don't make as many mistakes. Look what's going on right now, brothers and sisters in Christ. People are getting impatient. They're making mistakes. Oh, I'm going to take my eyes off Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. Since he didn't come when I wanted him to come, and he should have come any day now, I'm not going to look for the, the imminent return of Jesus Christ anymore. It's, you know, the Bible does say in this present world, Looking for that blessed hope. Present tense. Paul was looking for it. Peter was looking for it. John was looking for it. Timothy was looking for it. And I can go through all the names. The early church was looking for it. Down through the centuries, everybody, all the church was looking for it. The body of Christ. But now today we've got brethren that are turning their back on it. We might go through some hard times. I've never said Jesus is guaranteed to come back today. He's guaranteed to come. I've never said that. I said that we're supposed to keep our eyes open and our hope that could Jesus come back today with the life that you're living? Could Jesus come back tomorrow? How are you doing with the stuff that we're talking about? How are you living for the Lord? Mm -hmm. Patient in tribulation. Continuing instant in prayer. The Bible says to pray without ceasing. When we want wisdom, we ask God, who giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not. When we need help, we ask God. When there's things we don't understand in the Bible, we ask God. Okay? Prayer is very important. Are you continuing in prayer, brother and sister Christ? With everything that's going on, brethren fighting against brethren, are you praying for us? For the, for the truth to be revealed to whoever's wrong? Are you praying? Okay. Are you praying for the brethren through these hard times? Are you praying for yourself in the sense of that I don't fall away? 
That's my biggest prayer lately because I see it happening left and right. And I'm using this as an encouragement. Brothers and sisters of Christ, don't be part of the falling away. If you, if you find out that you have been part of the falling away, if you've been slacking, I haven't really been praying as much as I used to, I haven't been reading the Bible as much as I used to, uh, get back to it. Let God pick you back up. Okay? He can. No matter how far you've fallen, God can pick you back up if you let Him and get you going again. Continue instant in prayer. 13. Distributing to the necessity of the saints. Given to hospitality. In these last days, it's going to be very important. You've got brethren that are very prideful. And you can have brethren that fight you on it and won't let you. They won't let you. Distribute to the necessity of the saints. Give to hospitality. I don't want your help. No, I ain't taking your help. You try, though. That's the important part. You try. But be there for one another. Verse 14. Bless them which persecute you. Notice it says, what does it say after that? Bless and curse not. How many, of, how many men in ministry are failing this? Oh, they all need to die. They all de they're deserving of hell, but they're all saying you go, need to go to hell, and they need to go to hell and burn for all eternity, and this and everything. It's like bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. The enemies of the ministry. Lord, open their eyes. Lord, open their eyes. I don't pray that they go to hell. I don't pray that they that God would just strike them down dead. Bless them which persecute you. You say, well, what if it's a Jesuit coadjutor or someone high-level Jesuit? God opened their eyes. There's people that have come out of the Jesuit system. Uh, Roberto Riviera, I think is his name. There's people who have come out of hardcore Jesuits. Came out. Paul was a hardcore Pharisee. Killing Christians. God saved him. What are our prayers supposed to be? Our prayer is not, our attitude isn't like, are right, supposed to be go to hell and I wish God drops you dead? There's times where we pray that God distracts them. Say, Lord, please distract the enemy. Keep them off us so we can continue doing the work longer. Absolutely. But are we supposed to be praying for death? That God just kills them? We're going to get to that. God might kill them. Absolutely. Further down, when we get back down to it, it says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. You just say, Lord, I give them to you. They're enemies. They're really destroying this world. They're doing some very vile, wicked things. Lord, I give them to you. Lord, I pray that their eyes will be open, that they will drop the pride, and they can get saved. But ultimately, Lord, I give them to you. Isn't that hard these days? Absolutely. Especially when this verse is being applied to a brother or sister in Christ. When you start getting persecuted by a brother or sister in Christ. Over Christmas, I had a lot of attacks from people that are supposed to be brethren. Personal attacks, name calling. I don't wish any of them dead. I don't wish any of them dead. Well, I pray that they're saved. And they're part of the falling away and they're misguided. That's my first prayer, that they are saved so we will be together in heaven someday. And if they're false converts, that God will open their eyes. Drop the pride. Time is running out. I've linked gospel messages to people. Time is running out. And I mean it. You could die any day. There's no promise of tomorrow for the lost world. And for us, brothers and sisters in Christ, the only promise we have is when we do die... We get to go to heaven. Okay, we're sealed into the day of redemption. God will redeem us one day, catching away the body of Christ. Okay. And it says, and curse not. Hell is a curse. Be very careful. Be careful that you're not backbiting and whispering when it comes to brethren. Okay. Pray for them. I pray that God opens the eyes of my brothers and sisters in Christ that disagree with me on holidays. I pray for them. Okay? I don't curse them. Rejoice with them that do rejoice. Are you rejoicing with them that do rejoice, brothers and sisters in Christ? Okay? 
Uh, I know songs that's like, Rejoice, Rejoice, O Christian. We're supposed to rejoice that God has saved us. Rejoicing together. But more importantly, when you see good things happen to a brother in Christ, do you rejoice with them or do you get bitter about it? Especially if you don't think that they deserve it. Okay? Do you rejoice with them when good things happen? Get to the second half and weep with them that weep. There are brethren that, are go that, I, that have wronged me and said some bad things about me and have turned their back on me. And I still pray for them. And when they're going through bad times, I'll weep with them. I don't want to see them go through bad times. I want that God to open their eyes. And I tell God sometimes, not that I'm commanding God, but I said, Lord, even if it means doing whatever it takes to open their eyes, do whatever it takes to break. When I say break them, break that wall of pride. Do whatever it takes, Lord. But I'm not wishing evil on them. I'm not wishing evil on them. Do you weep with them that weep? This can also help out with the lost world. When good things are happening to the lost world, do you rejoice with them and give God glory? They won't, but do you give God glory for it? Because if God didn't want it to happen, it wouldn't have happened. When the lost world is weeping, do you weep with them and say, Oh Lord, it's happening for a reason, Lord, and you still give God glory. And you give God thanks. It's hard. But today, brothers and sisters of Christ, it just seems like we're at each other's throats sometimes. The brethren are so divided because wolves in sheep clothing come in and got you to turn from this book and start going the ways of the world and start putting your flesh above the Word of God. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Be very careful. We need to come together. Um, be of the same mind one towards another, brother says Christ. Here it is again. Be of the same mind one towards another. There's brethren out there who say, oh, it's not a big deal. It's not a big issue. Uh, yes, it is. The things that aren't a big issue, and I said that in my, one of my recent studies, I said, listen, if we're talking about something that's just a theory, and we say, well, my theory is, and he's got a theory, and this brother over here's got a theory, that's not something you argue over. But when someone says, the Bible says this is okay, and it's sin, it's wickedness, that's not okay. And you've got brethren out there that have fallen for the lost world's talks about, oh, we can agree to disagree. How'd that work out for America? I'm not saying America was predominantly Christian, but this Bible was the foundation of how we set our laws, what's right, what's wrong. And over time, instead of sticking to the Bible and saying, thus saith the Lord, it went to, we can agree to disagree. And how did that, how'd that work out for America? Sodomy's out of control. Feminism's out of control. Our children are being destroyed. On and on and on and on. All because we had the attitude of we need to just agree to disagree. They can do their thing over there and you do your thing over there. And we can just agree to disagree. And you've got that same satanic philosophy. Philosophy. Trying to infiltrate the Bible. The Bible believing. I want to say the Bible movement. The Bible believing movement. But the body of Christ. You have that same satanism. Where does Paul ever say we can. In those terms. In those words. We can agree to disagree on anything when it comes to the Word of God. He keeps saying this time and time again, be of the same mind one towards another. What can we do in these last days? We need to start coming together and being of one mind. If it isn't in Scripture, and you claim, I'm doing this for the Lord, but it's nowhere in Scripture in any way, shape, or form, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Stop doing it. Because you're not doing it for the Lord. You're doing it for yourself. You're doing it for the lovers of pleasures. You're falling back into the trap of loving the world and the ways of the world. Notice it says here after it says, Be the same mind one towards another. It says, Mind not high things. The Bible says that, that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. When you start realizing the way the world's going and what's highly esteemed among men, are you getting that junk out of your life? Mind not high things. What's popular? Bible says, be not conformed to this world. We just read it. Uh, love not the world. Neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I had a, a brother teach that that's talking about you, you can't love things more than you love God. And I agree with him. But more importantly, I believe that's talking about the ways of the world. 
what the world holds, what the world has, says this has value, where the Bible says that has no value. Pagan traditions have value. They have no value. Okay. They don't have any value. Love not the world. Mind not high things, but consent to men of low estate. Brothers and sisters of Christ, the body of Christ is going to be full of men and brothers and sisters of Christ of low estate. Especially in these last days. We're not conforming to the world. We're not loving the world. We're being a brighter light. Like I said, as the world gets more wicked and more wicked, our light shines more. Okay? But we're considered low estate. We're not worth... We're not considered of any worth to this world. We have no value to this world. But there are some, there are some, that get saved, they see the value of being Bible-believing, God-fearing. They see the value. They see something in you that they want. You've got something that's of value. Very few people. The doors haven't closed to preaching the gospel, brothers and sisters of Christ. They have not. Okay, consent to men of low estate. Don't get caught up in the respecter of persons. Don't get caught up in it. Okay. This man is famous and he's, he's a great preacher and a great man of God. Don't get caught up in that stuff. All these men that become respecter of persons and people start worshiping them, they start, ha they start having mistakes. Be careful. You start, you start ignoring their mistakes. I'll say it that way. Be not wise in your own conceits. Be not wise in your own conceits. This is the final authority, brothers and Christ. If I'm failing the Lord in some way, I put out my email address out there. I put my P.O. box out there. I've offered to connect with people on Skype, on uh, the Messenger for Facebook, video chat. Be not wise in your own conceits. If I'm doing something wrong, come to me with the Word of God. Not feelings and opinions. Not worldly traditions. The Word, excuse me, the Word of God. And I'm here. I don't want to be wise in my own conceits. I'm here. Come talk to me. Okay, let's fellowship. Let's find out through the Scriptures whether I'm wrong or you're wrong. Not whether I'm right and you're right. The Scriptures are always right. But which one of us is not following the scriptures? I'm here. All right. Verse 7. Recompense to no man evil for evil. All they've done wrong to me, I wish them death. They tried... I felt bad when a brother cries. It's like talking about death uh, for, st for stealing. Yeah, in the Old Testament, you had three, three, ways, three choices when you were caught stealing. You could try to fight, which in which case that you deserve to die. You can give up, put down what you're trying to steal and surrender, in which case you don't deserve to die, but you have to pay recompense. Or you can flee and run. Those are the three choices a man has when he gets caught stealing. The all three choices isn't death. If a man gets up, gives up, puts down what he's stealing, and lays down and gives up, and you shoot him, it's murder. It's not justified. Okay? Brothers of Christ... Recompense to no man evil for evil. Okay, defend yourself, absolutely. Protect you and your family, absolutely. But in these last days, you're going to have a lot, the tensions are going to build up, brother, says Christ. You're going to have neighbor turning against neighbor. And it's, it's going to probably get really bad before we get caught up. It could get really, really bad before we get caught up. Remember, we're not supposed to recompense to no man evil for evil. You're to defend yourself but you don't have the attitude that they stole from me, therefore I'm going to kill them. No, if they stole from you and they got away with it, they didn't get away with it. Why? Because we're going to get to here. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. You give them to the Lord and say, Lord, you'll deal with that person. As a saved sinner, I got cheated. I sold a really good Jeep to get, uh, I traded it in for, another tr for a truck and some cash on the side so I could use that cash to pay off all my debts. And I did use that cash to pay off all my debts, except for the house. Um, but that truck, when I got it back here, and I drove it all the way back here, I bought it as is, used, as is, 
and it had so many problems. I got cheated. And I could have, you know, you could lose your temper, go back and do something stupid. But what I did was is I paid to have those things fixed, took time, and I gave it to the Lord and said, Lord, you deal with that, that company that, that defrauded me. They're yours. You deal with them. Okay? We don't rep recompense no man evil for evil. And one of the things I've been seeing online lately is, and you need to check yourself, brothers and sisters in Christ that have been doing this, that you try to use one sin to justify another. You're recompensing evil for evil. I'm calling out sin, so you try to bring up a sin of my past to try to justify the sin of your present. That's what the lost world does. The easy believism crowd. That's not what a Bible-believing, God-fearing man does. If someone comes to me and points out a sin that I'm doing according to the Scriptures, and I'm 100% wrong, my first thought is, is, what about his sins? That's the flesh. Well, I might be doing this wrong, but, but they're doing this wrong, and that, and that, and that, and that, and that. And I have to stop myself and say, wait a second. At this point in time, it's not about them. It's about me. They came to me to correct me on a sin. You brought them into my life, Lord. It is what I'm doing wrong. Yes, it is. I need to change it. But what we see is people falling into this trap of one sin justifies another. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. You do not recompense evil for evil. To no man evil for evil. Okay? I know it's talking more like the physical act, but I'm just throwing that in there for instruction on righteousness. One sin does not justify another sin. If I sin, that doesn't justify you sinning. That falls back under the respect of persons. Okay? If you see someone who's a high estate and they're sinning everything, oh, we got to keep quiet, we got to keep quiet. No, you correct them. You correct them. Okay. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Provide things that are honest. Brothers and sisters of Christ, in these last days, that is so important. That is so important. Okay. What I mean by that is truth. Providing things that are honest among one another, Lord, in the sight of all men, but especially among the brethren. Okay? I'm getting so sick and tired of the lies. I'm so sick and tired of these wolves in sheep's clothing and catching them. I'm so sick and tired of false converts. I'm so sick and tired of men falling away from truth. They're falling away from truth. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. I want truth again in the body of Christ. We, in these last days... I want the brethren to stay focused and fighting for truth, fighting together for truth. Okay. But provide honest in, the, honest in the sight of all men. You're going to have the lost world, going back to the lost world, what are we supposed to do? You go to the lost world and you look at them and how they're treating one another and how they're going to start treating us, especially how bad it's getting. We're still supposed to be providing honest, be things honest in the sight of all men. We're not supposed to take advantage of people. We're not supposed to, like I was talking about that truck <laughs> that I got, uh, I was cheated. I was lied to. It had a lot of major problems. We're not supposed to defraud one another. We're supposed to provide things honest. Okay? If you tell, if you tell a neighbor, I'm going to help you, help them. Don't just offer your help because I'm trying to pretend like I'm a good Christian, and then you don't go help them. Okay? Don't lose your testimony with the neighbors by saying, this is wrong, and then you're doing it. Okay? Provide things that are honest in the sight of all men. Verse 18, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. This is a tough one. I see brethren in ministry getting up there, and they're threatening the evil, wicked world to come get them. And I'm like, uh, you shouldn't be doing that, brother. Why? Because it says here, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peacefully with all men. You're not trying to live peacefully. You're trying to cause conflict. Okay? You give them to the Lord. Lord, vengeance is yours. I give them to you. Lord, protect this home. Distract the enemies that want to come after me and attack me and destroy this ministry, God's ministry, my usefulness in the ministry, whether they're trying to get my flesh to turn against me or they're trying to get brethren to turn against me. Regardless, as much as, as if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peacefully with all men. Peacefully. And we're supposed to strive to do that. 
This whole thing that's going on in the world today, it's going to start, they're starting to fighting and the rioting and the, uh, the picketing and everything. If it all be possible, we need to live peacefully among all men. Could the fighting spill over into your yard? It could. It really could. And then at that point, you need to defend yourself and defend your family. Absolutely. But you don't go out there starting a fight. You don't go out there and live by the sword. What does the Bible say? If you live by the sword, you what? Ye shall die. You're not supposed to live by the sword. If you live by the sword, you will die. You can defend yourself, but you're not supposed to be going out there challenging him. Look at Paul. Look at Peter. When they were getting arrested, did they go, you ain't going to take me alive and pull out their swords and just fight him to the death? No. Okay. They got arrested. They got put in prison. They didn't fight. Okay, if it be possible, life in you live peacefully among all men. It might get so bad, brother says Christ, you might get hauled off to a consecration camp. If they come to my door, and I've told this to some brethren, if they come to my door and they knock on my door and say, listen, it's, 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 it's national law, you have to take the COVID vaccine. Okay. Or go to, uh, to a concentration camp. You know what? I'll grab my Bible and say, I'm not taking that shot. And you go to the concentration camp. You don't sit here and go, I'm going to fight to the death. You guys have no place here and no business here and fight, fight, fight. You get shot and killed and you stand before the Lord and the Lord's just going, I could have still used you. There was people at that camp that needed, the wit needed Jesus Christ preached to them. All right? If they come in and they try to force you to take the shot, by all means, you defend yourself. And if you die, you die. If they get you with the shot without killing you, now you got three more years to serve the Lord. you got three more years to serve the Lord before you get to go home to be with the Lord, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Be very careful. Be very, very careful, brothers and Christ. If it all be possible, live peaceably with all men. If it all be possible, and that possible part has to do with self-defense. Be very careful. Mm -hmm. You can have neighbors that wrong you. You can have brethren that wrong you. But if all be possible, you give them to the Lord. 19. Dearly beloved, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Give it to God. That person wronged you, by all means, you don't just throw yourself back out there to get hurt again and again and again and again. That's foolishness. But when someone's hurt you, physically, spiritually, false converts, brothers in Christ, they're getting deceived by false converts, wolves in sheep's clothing. All right. You give them to the Lord. Lord, please open their eyes. Lord, I give them to you. You'll deal with them. I will repay, their, their, repay saith the Lord. Verse 20, and here's the part that gets me when you have people that say, Hey, I wish that they, were, they just go to hell. They die and go to hell. Why, what's with verse 20 then? Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. This would probably never happen, but if I came across, I had food in my bag, and I came across the Pope, sitting there hurt, bleeding, hungry, patch him up, give him food, witness to him for Jesus Christ. Is he going to listen? No. But that's how we're supposed to be with the enemy. We're not supposed to, oh, there's the Pope hurting, bleeding, I'm just going to pull out my sword and end it. Uh, no. These enemies of the ministry, these wicked, wicked, vile men out there, and they are very wicked, vile men, the Jesuit order that's destroying everything, but God's allowing the Jesuit order. He's moving the pieces together. Not that Je Jesuit order says, look what we've accomplished, and God's looking up there and he's laughing. <laughs> you, <laughs> so vain, so prideful. They're not doing it. God is. God's allowing it. Okay. Therefore, if thy enemy hunger, feed him. What are we supposed to be doing in these days? What do we do today? We do our best to warn people about what's going on out there today. And if it's possible, if there's people that are hungry, feed them. If he thirsts, give him drink. Your enemy. For in so doing that shall heap coals of fire on his head. The Bible says, whose damnation is just. 
when they stand before God at the great white throne, their damnation is just. If they die and go to hell, their damnation is just. We give out gospel tracts to keep, breath, keep the lost world accountable. Not, we're not trying to get people saved left and right. A big revival! It's not going to happen. But we put hand out gospel tracts to keep the lost world accountable. So when they stand before Jesus Christ at the great white throne, their damnation is just. Future tense. And I say, if. Who knows? If one of them might repent someday. One of them might get saved. Here you are wishing someone to go to hell and that they would die and everything. And it's like, what if they get saved a year from now? Six months from now? Two months from now? And they come to you, oh, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I was serving Satan. I was a high-level Jesuit. Uh, hopefully that would humble you. <laughs> okay? Be very careful. When they die in their sins and go to, to hell to burn and then have to stand before Jesus Christ and get judged and then tossed in the lake of fire to burn for all eternity, their damnation is just. But today, how are we supposed to treat them? We treat them by pre preaching the truth to them. We preach truth to them. They're hungry, you feed them. They're thirsty, you give them food, water. Okay. Why? Because ultimately what's going on today, this last verse, verse 21, what's ultimately going on today, brothers and Christ, is be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good with good. This right here. The Bible tells us what to do. Right there, with good. Is it a good thing to feed someone who's hungry? Yeah. Is it a good thing to feed someone who's thirsty? Yeah. But he's an enemy. Doesn't matter. Okay. There's some wicked things done on the battlefield, but there were some battlefields where they were taking the enemies that were wounded and they were patching them up. They were still prisoners of war, but they were patching them up and taking care of them. Because that's the good thing to do. How do you treat your enemy? You tell them the truth. You preach truth to them. They don't want the truth. God, they're in your hands. You deal with them. If they're like elite enemies that have to do with like the high-level Catholicism and Jesuit order and everything, you pray to God, Lord, keep them off our back long enough to continue doing your work. Continue li so we can continue to live for you, O oh Lord. That's what you do. That's what you pray. You don't pray, God, strike him dead right now, right here. You don't do that. You say, Lord, you take, Lord, I give him to you. Can you do what it takes to keep him off our back and everything? And if God decides that his way of keeping him off your back is striking him with lightning and killing him, then that's God's, that's God's way. Okay? If God wants to kill him, then God will kill him. But you give that to God, and it's God that's the final authority, not us. We can only, we, we're just to pray, Lord, keep them off our backs. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Be not overcome with evil. That's a big thing for these last days, brothers and Christ. Be not overcome with evil. Don't start acting like the lost world. Okay? Don't start looking like the lost world. Don't start arguing like the lost world. Don't start fighting like the lost world. Don't start becoming prideful and bitter like the lost world. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Brothers and sisters of Christ, I was reading this the last few, two, few days, and I just noticed this was just more like a Bible reading, not an actual Bible study. It's just a Bible reading. I wanted to remind you, brothers and sisters of Christ, more than anything that you walk away from this video, and I'm sorry for how long it was, is this. No matter what's going on out there, brothers and sisters of Christ, we're still to continue living for the Lord. Our life doesn't change. It changed when we got saved. Our life changed then. Nothing that goes on out there in the world justifies another change. We're, we were changed at salvation. Now God is sanctified is sanctifying our life. He's taught us what we're to stand for, absolute truth. He's taught us how to live our lives, how we're supposed to treat people, whether they're brothers and sisters in Christ, whether it's the lost world or an enemy. We need to continue living the life of Christ. We need to continue keeping our eyes on Jesus Christ with the life that we live. 
We're not supposed to change. The world is changing. It's getting worse and worse and worse out there. We're not supposed to change. We're supposed to be continue going on for the Lord Jesus Christ. Tough times might come. I might get kicked off YouTube. Uh, they keep talking about the Great Reset, Brother Jesus Christ, this big Great Reset that's coming out. And they're going to reset the internet, and when it comes back on, some of us might not be allowed to get back on. Right now, I'm already having problems, and I, the internet speed says I've got good speed. Yet, I'm having problems with lag and with certain sites like YouTube and, and Facebook and stuff like that. Some sites come up super fast, some sites are lagging. The main sites that everybody's using. The main sites that we're, I'm using and, and other brethren out there are using to preach the gospel and to uh, fellowship with the brethren and preach the word to the brethren and to encourage the brethren. Okay, I don't know what's going to happen. I might not be on the internet. We might get shut down on the internet. Okay, it's going to be very sorrowful and very hard if I don't get to not be able to, you know, be able to fellowship what little fellowship there is. But like I said, I think the solution is we're going to have to start forming house churches and coming back together physically. That means moving, not like moving all around the world. But I'm saying, you know, states having a, a house church in each state where the brethren can move and, and you all work together and strive together for the gospel and for the Lord. Absolutely. I'm all for that. But uh, I don't know what the future holds, Brother Sister Christ, but no matter how bad it gets out there, don't let it change who you are. You are a man of God, a daughter of God, a woman of God, son of God, a daughter of God. You're a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman. Don't let the world change you. Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. So hopefully, it's just an encouragement video. It's, it's a long video, but a Bible reading where we did some encouragement. And I hopefully this encouraged you, brothers and sisters, Christ, to get back in the Word of God, get back into sanctification through the Word of God. Sanctification through the Word of God, not through the world, not through feelings and opinions, but through the Word of God. Um, making sure that you're living for Jesus Christ according to His Word, once again, not according to the world, not according to traditions of men, not according to the flesh, not according to feelings and opinions, but get back to living for the Lord through His Word. Every day, Lord. I pray this for the, I say that, Lord, every day I pray that my life, I'm living for Him every day, and that the brethren stay strong and live, and that you live for Him every day, brothers and sisters in Christ. So grace and peace from God our Father. And our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, and my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I am praying for you, brothers and sisters in Christ. Please, please, when you pray for me, make sure that love isn't, <laughs> it's true love. And, you know, like I said, pray for my physical, like I said, my knees and my lower back. Having a seizure disorder for nine years, I knew, I knew it was going to catch up to me someday. I kept running 100 miles an hour as a lost man. And I knew it was going to catch up on to me today. So I set this whole setup for us so I can turn to the scriptures and read with you guys more like I used to. And uh, I don't know, I'll still try to do some standing up studies. Um, I just won't be able to do the hour to two hour studies. If we're doing an hour to two hour study, it's going to be here, brothers and sisters Christ. It's going to be here. So, brothers and sisters Christ, that was just a reading. Eventually, I'd like to do some expository studies on, on Romans because there's a lot of good chapters in there where you can really compare a lot of scripture with scripture with scripture, which I love Bible studies. But I also like videos where you're being encouraged. And I'm trying to encourage you, brothers and sisters Christ, grace and peace. Okay, I want you to have grace and peace in your life as a Christian, as a Bible-believing, God-fearing man and woman. And no matter how bad it gets, you stick to the Word, you have faith in God, He knows what He's doing, no matter how bad it gets, God's going to show grace in your life. He's going to give you peace in your life. You'll be shocked on the, the smallest things that will happen that will give you joy, no matter how bad things get, the littlest things. God will do something to get you to smile. He does that to me. No matter how sorrowful I get, He does something. It was pouring down rain. I'll give you an example. It was pouring down rain. And I was getting very sorrowful because we've had tons of rain. Winter is a hard year. The hardest time of the year for me is winter. I like being outside. I like going for walks. I like talking with the Lord. I like working outside. Um, being stuck indoors, I get a lot of temptation to go back to junk that I know I'm not supposed to go back to. I'm pointing at my computer over here. 
Um, and I get tempted and I'll go out and I'll set, I'll get to the point where I sit outside with some hot tea. I got some hot tea for this morning and I'll watch it rain. I'm sitting out there freezing <laughs> with a blanket wrapped around me and watching it rain and just talking with the Lord. I, I like being outdoors. It's a tough time. And I just start getting sorrowful with everything that's going on, the division, the attacks uh, that I've been getting uh, from people that used to call me brother in Christ, and now they're saying I'm lost. I'm, oh, you're just flat out lost. You're a fake, you're a false convert and everything. And, and I'm sitting out there, and I'm just talking with the Lord. And all of a sudden, a hole forms up just in time for the sun to shine straight through. And in that time where I'm sitting there, and it just seems like times are tough and, you know, Things aren't going so well. It got me to smile. God got me to smile. And there's times where he'll open holes and they'll reflect off the ocean and get what I call the silver. The reflection is the silver. And it doesn't matter how tough it gets, brother, sister, in Christ. God, God will give us peace sometimes. A lot of times if you let him. God will give you joy in tribulation. You got to be patient in tribulations so you can see that joy. You gotta be patient in tribulation so you can see that peace that God has for you. What's the opposite of patient? You get in a rush. And what happens when you get in a rush? You start making mistakes. You start overlooking things. You don't see the joy that God has planned. You don't see the peace that God has for you. You overlook it because you get into a rush because you're not being patient. So in these tribulation times that are coming, you need to learn to be patient and not overlook the gifts that God's got for you, the plans that God has for you. So I'll say this again. Grace and peace from God our Father. Grace and peace from God our Father. And our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I encourage you because I love you. I correct you because I love you. Not me lording over you. It's because I love you. I preach against sin because I love you. God loved me to show me what was sinful in my life through another brother in Christ. I'm doing the same. It's out of love, brother and sister Christ. It's out of love. So, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. I'm going to try to get this other study out. So, I'll see you in the next video.